Number 1. In March of 2009, she posted an entry on True Crime Diary that she titled Coastal Killer. In it she detailed five murders in three separate cases. The first Kelly Disney. 17-year-old Kelly was last seen on March 1, 1984 around 1 a.m. on Highway 20 in Newport, Oregon. She disappeared without a trace. On May 3, 1992, two other teens disappeared. 17-year-old Melissa Sanders and her family went camping at Beverly Beach State Park, just two short miles from Newport. Melissa's friend, 19-year-old Sheila Swanson, joined them. After a night of camping, the two teens decided to leave their tent. They were seen around 11 p.m. on a payphone at Beverly Beach Grocery on Highway 101. Their remains were discovered on October 10 by hunters in Eddyville, nearly 20 miles from where the two teens went missing. The bodies were roughly 50 feet from a logging road under brush. They were too badly decomposed to determine a cause of death. The next year, 16-year-olds Jennifer Essen and Carl Lees had been at friend's house watching movies with Jennifer's boyfriend. Around 12.45 to 1 a.m. the girls left. In an eerie moment before leaving, Jennifer told her boyfriend that if he didn't hear from her in an hour and a half to call the police. It was late and it had been rainy. But the girls decided to walk home. A route that would take them to Northwest 56th Street toward Highway 101. Jennifer never called her boyfriend after she left. Two and a half weeks later, loggers stumbled upon Jennifer and Kara's remains. They said they had found a body near Mulak Beach. Again the remains were under the brush, stacked on top of one another. The first case that was traced to Fowler via his DNA was out of Prince George, British Columbia. It took place on what has become known as the Highway of Tears. 16-year-old Colleen McMillan was last seen hitchhiking from home to her friend's house in August of 1974. Her remains were found about a month later. Her body was located off a logging road near 100 Mile House, and according to investigators it looked like she was strangled. They were able to preserve DNA from Colleen's crime scene, specifically her blouse, by carefully collecting and storing the evidence left at the scene. In 2012, RCMP submitted DNA for a third time through international databases. The DNA matched Bobby Jack Fowler who had died six years earlier while in prison. In October 1973, Gail Ways was on her way from Clearwater to Kamloops to see her parents. She had been working two jobs, one in a pub, to save money for a trip to Mexico. The night she disappeared, she was looking for someone in the pub to give her a ride home. Gail ended up hitchhiking. Her remains were found the following spring, on a logging road, just like the others. When Fowler was named a suspect in the case, the family put out a statement requesting information. Specifically if someone possibly found her clothes. Pamela Darling disappeared in November of 1973. She was last seen at a bar in downtown Kamloops. Her body was discovered much faster, just the next day. She was face down at a park in the South Thompson River. According to investigators she was found nude with bite marks. 17-year-old Bambi Lynn Dick disappeared from Davenport, Iowa. She had gone to a quiet riot and axe concert at the Davenport's Colonel Ballroom on September 29, 1983. When Bambi didn't arrive home from the concert, her parents filed a missing person report two days later. Her family told authorities that Bambi had never run away. They continued the search for her. On October 8, 1983, a biker discovered partially clothed human remains on Highway 287 in Amarillo, Texas. Law enforcement determined the victim had been strangled. But there was no sign of sexual assault. The body remained unidentified until 2009. Number 2. Tamla Horsford arrived at the party around 8.30 p.m. The 40-year-old black mother had made dinner for her five sons and husband, Leander, before heading out to celebrate the birthday of her friend Jean Myers. Myers had invited a group of moms, most who'd met through the local youth football league, to spend the night, not wanting anyone to drink and drive. Harsford arrived with a bottle of tequila and a small overnight bag, and changed into white Onisi pajamas covered in paw prints shortly after she got there. The party, held the evening of November 3, 2018, was originally meant to be all women. 
but Meyer's boyfriend, Jose Barrera, and Tom Smith, the husband of another attendee, ended up sticking around. In the end, the group, who advocates for Horsford would later dub the Forsyth 12, included nine women, two men, and one husband who, according to police interviews, only dropped off and picked up his wife. Out of these 12, eight were planning to spend the night, as was Tamla. While the women drank, socialized, and watched the LSU-Alabama game upstairs, Barrera and Smith watched football in Meyer's finished basement. During this time, Harsford, the only habitual smoker at the party, regularly stepped out to the balcony for cigarettes. She also smoked marijuana that evening, but Myers asked her to stop. According to Myers' own statement, she had teased Horsford during the conversation, calling her the female Bob Marley, and reminding her that Barrera worked as a pre-trial officer and did not approve. Eventually, the men joined the party and the group played cards against humanity. Photographs and videos captured during the game show Horsford smiling, happy. She had been drinking tequila and would later be found to have a significant back, but according to photos, videos, and witness accounts, Horsford didn't appear particularly drunk that evening. Guests who weren't spending the night began to leave around 11.30 p.m., while those who were staying trickled off to bed over the next couple of hours. According to police interviews, Horsford remained awake after Myers and Barrera headed to bed around 1.30 a.m. The last person to see Horsford was Bridget Fuller, who was picked up by her husband at 1.47. In her statement, Fuller says that Horsford was eating a bowl of gumbo and had said she planned to smoke a cigarette and head to bed. Over the next 10 minutes, the home security system registered the back door opening, closing, and then opening again, for the last time, at 1.57 a.m. around 8.45 the next morning, Madeline Lombardi, Meyer's aunt who lived at the house, headed into the kitchen to make her morning cup of coffee. In her interview with police, Lombardi describes seeing something chilling through the window, in the backyard, the white dog print on a sea. It was Horsford, face down in the grass, not moving. After saying a prayer, Lombardi headed upstairs to find Myers, telling her something appeared to be wrong with her friend from the islands. Forsyth County 911 got the call just before 9 a.m. On the line, both Myers and Barrera speak. She's not moving one bit. She's not breathing. She's completely face down in the yard. She is stiff, Barrera tells the dispatcher. She was drinking, and it looks like, I'm guessing maybe she fell off the balcony, Myers offers. Harsford was pronounced dead at the scene and her body sent for autopsy. But even before the report came back, the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office began to work the theory that Horsford's death had been an accident, a fall from the second-story outdoor deck. The case remained open for almost four months until the FSCO made their official determination on February 20, 2019, two weeks after the State of Georgia Medical Examiner provided their final report. The FSCO pointed to the toxicology report, which tested positive for THC and clocked her blood alcohol content at 0.238, just shy of three times the legal limit to drive. With a back typically associated with blackouts, loss of coordination, and even vomiting, the FCSO determined that marijuana and alcohol use likely contributed to the fall. They also noted the door alarm log as well as an unlit cigarette and lighter Barrera said he found on the upper deck. Together, the investigators found that this evidence suggested Horsford went out for a cigarette sometime around 1.57 a.m. and accidentally fell to her death. When they closed the case, the department released the incident report and death investigation to the public. But these documents didn't provide the answers Horsford's family and friends were looking for, in fact, they only caused more confusion. How did a woman with that high of a back appear in control of her facilities, according to interviews as well as videos taken that night, yet manage to fall over a nearly four-foot railing and into the backyard? How could a house full of people, some asleep for less than a half hour, not hear Horsford fall to her death right outside their windows? Could a 15 to 20-foot fall cause not only death, but a dislocated wrist, broken neck, and laceration to her heart muscle? Why wasn't the scene preserved, evidence tested, or potential witnesses interviewed immediately? What really happened when the back door opened just before 2 a.m., and why was it left open until the next morning? 
And would the investigation have gone differently if Horsford wasn't the only black person at the party? Horsford was born in St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 1978, where she lived until her family moved to the Bronx in 1989. She'd met her husband in Florida, who had a daughter from a previous relationship, and they went on to have five sons together. When Horsford died, her youngest son was only four years old. By all accounts, Horsford was the life of the party, she liked to laugh, to dance, to have fun. When the Horsfords moved to Georgia five and a half years earlier for Leander's work, it was this warmth that had attracted Myers and others to the charismatic mother. Located about 40 miles northeast of Atlanta, Forsyth County is a primarily white suburban region in the Atlanta metropolitan area. The only incorporated city in the county is Cooming, which attracts families to its large lots, annual country fair, and quaint downtown. But Forsyth County has a deeply rooted history of animosity towards black people and was home to a racial cleansing in 1912. When a black man was blamed for the rape of a white woman and another was blamed for the rape and beating of a different white woman who died from her injuries, white mobs descended on local black homes and businesses. In the end, the town's 1,098 black residents, approximately 10% of the population at the time, were driven out. For decades, the county remained entirely white, and as recently as 1990, there were only 14 black residents in the entire county. A quintessential small southern town, everyone knows everyone in Cooming, and people seem to take care of their own. Take, for example, Sheriff Ron Freeman and current FCSO Deputy Coroner Chris Shelton. In 2014, Shelton was forced to resign from a nearby police force after distributing photos of himself posing with racist mammy dolls. Just two years later, he appeared in Facebook photos for Ron Freeman's 2016 campaign for sheriff. After Freeman won, Shelton was appointed deputy coroner for Forsyth County. Shelton also works for Operation 21 a business owned by law enforcement and military veteran Brian Debois that aims to educate offenders on the law to help reduce recidivism. According to campaign registration information, Brian's wife Anna also served as the treasurer on Freeman's 2016 campaign. According to social media posts, the Debloises are also friends with some of the individuals who were at the party, including Stacy and Tom Smith. Photos show the Smiths and Debloises boating, out to dinner, and celebrating birthdays with what Anna refers to as their friend family. Advocates for reopening the case have questioned whether these relationships may have contributed to FCSO's handling of the investigation. In response to an inquiry to the Forsyth County Coroner's Office, Forsyth County Attorney Ken Gerard told Rolling Stone that Shelton did not work on the Horsford case. Further, FCSO Public Information Officer Stacy Miller offered an unequivocal denial that any personal connections would have influenced the way the case was handled. There is no relationship between Ron Freeman and the Debloises or anyone else at the party the night of Tamla Horsford's tragic death, she told Rolling Stone, explaining that Freeman and Anna only knew each other in a limited professional capacity. The FCSO investigates each case with the same tenacity, without bias, no matter who the victim, witnesses, or suspects are. Miller also noted that the Forsyth County Coroner's Office is an independent agency, not affiliated with the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office. But the question surrounding Horsford's case goes beyond the optics of a black woman dying at a party with a group of white people. According to the autopsy from the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, Horsford showed blunt force trauma to her head, neck, torso, and extremities, including abrasions of the face, four types of hemorrhages in the skull and brain, dislocation of the right wrist, and cuts on her arms and legs. Additionally, she suffered a broken neck and laceration of the right ventricle of the heart. According to the incident report written by lead investigator Mike Christian, Horsford's body position was also examined at the scene. Most notable, when Tamla was turned over was the fact she had come to rest face down, Christian writes. Her head had not been canted to one side or the other. Horsford's legs were found extended behind her, with both feet pointing to the right and her right arm close to her body. Her left arm was found extended and bent at the elbow. Friends, family, and advocates have doubted whether Horsford's injuries and resting position could be the result of a fall from the balcony. 
Some have questioned whether the injuries to her hands and arms could be defensive wounds, which would suggest perhaps an altercation before either going over the balcony or being positioned in the backyard. In fact, the incident report shows that Christian's initial theory was that Horsford has experienced a fall not from the deck, but from the ground, due to landscaping edging that matched scrapes on Horsford's shins. According to the same report, Christian only brought the balcony fall theory to Dr. Andrew Koopmainers, associate medical examiner with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, after the medical examiner explained that the injuries suffered could not have been caused by a ground-level fall. In his final report, Coop Mainers concludes that it appeared as though she may have fallen from the deck, ultimately ruling that her injuries were consistent with those received in a roughly second-story fall. Potential evidence may also have been compromised or missed. The scene was never secured, and at least one witness, pre-trial officer Barrera, told investigators he touched the body, saying he moved Horsford's leg while trying to figure out if she was still alive. Barrera also said in his interview he found and moved the unlit cigarette and lighter on the deck before he saw the body. But because police believed the death to be an accident, no evidence was ever fingerprinted. And though Barrera states on the original 911 call that security cameras were installed and pointed at the backyard, the batteries were found to be dead and the cameras not recording. During the autopsy, neither a sexual assault kit nor fingernail clippings were collected. In a call with Rolling Stone, GBI Public Affairs Director Nellie Miles explained that these steps are not routine and weren't taken in this case because there was no indication of foul play. The GBI's Division of Forensic Science also declined to test the contents of the bottle of tequila that Horsford had brought that evening. Miles explained that it's standard policy not to test for illicit substances when the possible suspect is deceased as there would be nobody to hold accountable if they were to find drugs present. Police in this case also contributed to a feeling of distrust among the family early on. According to the incident report, Deputy Christian brought his theory that Horsford experienced a ground fall, not only to the medical examiner, but also to Horsford's father, Kurt St. Jower. The family struggled to understand how Horsford could have died from a ground-level fall, and when Horsford's husband later asked investigators about this theory and the confusion it caused, investigators agreed it had been a mistake to hypothesize to the family early on. We probably have created part of a mess here, Christian told Leander, according to interview transcripts. We had an idea of what happened which was absolutely wrong, Christian said of the ground fall theory. What I should have done probably was keep my mouth shut and not spun theories. But the shift to the balcony theory didn't answer all of the outstanding questions. While speaking with police roughly two weeks after the death, fellow party attendee Stacy Smith expressed doubt that Horsford could have fallen. I don't get it at all, Stacy told police, according to transcripts released by the FCSO. I mean I've been on that deck like a million times like, I've looked, and I've tried, testing a theory that a drunk Horsford had leaned over to vomit, but gone too far and I don't understand. Officer Sexton sympathized with her confusion, but continued to explore the fall theory. I mean like you said, that she leaned over, was trying to throw up or thought she was going to throw up, maybe she sat up on the rail and was smoking, he says. Or just who knows. Yet Stacy notes that Horsford wasn't acting sick, despite her high back, this is supported by the other interviews as well as videos and photos taken that night. In Fuller's interview with police, she explains that this may be due to Horsford being a seasoned drinker and says that it would take an enormous amount of alcohol to knock her on her ass. Diane Calavras, a friend of the victim, also had lingering questions. I just got several inconsistent stories, she said of her interactions with the group. The accident theory just doesn't make sense. Not when everyone there said she was fine. Suspicions were further raised in February 2019, when Jose Barrera, the parole officer and boyfriend of the homeowner, was fired after he used his position to illegally access the Horsford incident report and name record for Myers via the records management system database. This came to light as part of an ongoing conflict between the so-called Forsyth 12 and Horsford's close friend, Michelle Wynne Graves. Later that month, Seven of the individuals present the night of the incident, including Myers and Barrera, sued Graves for defamation, 
pointing to Facebook posts accusing them of being responsible for Horsford's death. That lawsuit was dismissed, but they have appealed. Myers and Barrera were dropped from the suit. Legal representation for the remaining five declined an interview for this story and did not respond to a list of questions about their clients and the larger case. Ashland Harris, an advocate for the reopening of the case and the organizer of the original Change.org petition, also claims she's been targeted for publicly criticizing the Forsyth County Sheriff's Department, alleging harassment by the agency. In November 2019, a Cooming police officer detained Harris while looking for three men involved in a car accident, calling in a Forsyth County Sheriff's Office deputy to help with the investigation. Harris was cleared and let go, but went on to file a complaint against the officer involved. He was later exonerated by Cooming Police Chief David Marsh. But Harris says her issues with local law enforcement continued. Later that same month, deputies from the FCSO showed up at her home with a warrant for her devices, based on the suspicion that Harris sent an accusatory anonymous email to one of the individuals present the night of Horsford's death. Harris denies authoring that email and has now sued Forsyth County Sheriff's Office Detective Jeffrey Rowe and Sheriff Ron Freeman for civil rights violations. The FCSO was not able to provide Rolling Stone with comment on pending litigation, but noted that it was not FCSO, but the Cooming Police Department, that initially detained Harris on November 15, 2019. Yet none of this, not the questions surrounding Horsford's death, nor the firing of Jose Barrera, seemed enough to convince the FCSO and GBI to take a closer look at the case. That is, until the Black Lives Matter movement reignited interest in the story on social media, catching the eye of celebrities including T.I., 50 Cent, Gabrielle Union, and Kim Kardashian. Influencers and individuals alike began to sign and share the Change.org petition to reopen the investigation, resulting in more than 600,000 signatures so far. In the midst of this, the Tampa lawyer representing Horsford's family, Ralph Fernandez, released a letter summarizing the findings of his own review of the evidence. He concluded that homicide is a strong possibility, pointing to the abrasions on Tamla's arms and hands that he believes could be defensive wounds. Fernandez also noted conflicting witness statements and issues with the initial investigation, including the unpreserved scene where Horsford's body was found. In particular, Fernandez was struck by the lack of autopsy photos, a practice he characterizes as unheard of and likely done at someone's direction. The autopsy photos would soon become a point of contention. Following Fernandez's letter, the FCSO and GBI released statements to local news source WSB-TV claiming autopsy photos were taken and standing behind their original conclusion. In response, Fernandez released a second public statement on June 12 that included records of multiple failed attempts to secure said autopsy photos. Based on the emails Fernandez released between himself and the FCSO and GBI, requests for these photographs appear to have been ignored, even when other requests were fulfilled. In an email to Rolling Stone, GBI confirmed that autopsy photos were taken and claimed the holdup is related to a missing release from Tamla's next of kin. However, Fernandez insists this release was not introduced until after he went public. As of publication, autopsy photographs have not been provided to Fernandez. The GBI has said they are happy to do so when provided with the release. While Fernandez has yet to see the photos, the FCSO did respond to mounting pressure. On June 12, just a few hours after Fernandez released his statement addressed to the two agencies, the sheriff's office announced that they'd formally ask the GBI to assume the case and open an independent investigation. It's a win for Horsford's family and friends, who just want to see answers for the woman they loved so much. People gravitated to her energy and warmth, said Elizabeth Potts, her mother, in a statement to Rolling Stone. Everywhere she lived, it was her home that became the house that all the neighbors and the neighbors' children congregated. But in this case, reopening the inquiry isn't likely to be enough for Horsford's friends, family, and legal representation. Many have called for an independent investigation into the case, unable to trust that the agencies responsible will conduct an unbiased investigation or hold anyone found to have been involved accountable.
This includes Fernandez, who called the GBI compromised in a public statement following the death of Rayshard Brooks, killed by police in Atlanta, after falling asleep in his car in a Wendy's drive through This case is an indictment of the quality of the work that GBI does when there are no videos, Fernandez told Rolling Stone of the Horsford case, referencing the video that captured Brooks' final moments. Due to this distrust in the GBI, Fernandez is now pushing for the FBI to take on the case. Yet the GBI has made it clear that they intend to do a comprehensive independent investigation that takes into account all possible evidence. We're looking at everything, said GBI representative Miles. So if there is information, particularly new information, that's out there, we are encouraging people to come forward. As for the family, they just want the truth. We want answers, Elizabeth says. We want justice. Anyone with tips should call the Georgia Bureau of Investigation at 1-800-597-TIPS-8477. Number 3. It took years for Sharon Fahey to believe that her former neighbor had not in fact killed her four-year-old daughter. But once she heard details from an investigation into Walter Ogrod's 1996 conviction, she was all in. That's when it really started sinking in that he definitely didn't do it and he needs to get out of jail, Fai said in an interview with NBC10 earlier this month. Fai was determined to help any way she could. I went to court and I signed a paper saying that I didn't believe he did it and that he should be let out of jail, she said. In June last year, a judge overturned Walter Ogrod's murder conviction and pulled him off death row. After 28 years behind bars for a murder he didn't commit, Ogrod was free. But that also meant that Barbara Jean Horn's killer has, for now, escaped justice. It's just opening another, you know, nightmare again, just to have to go through everything all over again, Fai said. But Fai and her family are intent on finding the real killer. Me and my family can't just let this go, Fai said. And there is some hope. During its investigation into Ogrod's conviction, the Philadelphia District Attorney's Conviction Integrity Unit found two suspects they believed may have killed Barbara Jean Horn. We think that there is more evidence suggesting they did it than Walter Ogrod ever, Patricia Cummings, head of the Conviction Integrity Unit, said. But it's not enough, and at least it's not enough at this point in time. Cummings declined to name the two suspects, but said that one is dead and the other is behind bars serving time for another crime. She said Philadelphia police detectives aren't helping them with what she says should be a reopen case. As of today, I don't think that appetite exists, she said. A police spokesman said that due to the increase in gun violence, cold case detectives are busy helping investigate the current onslaught of homicides. And so, the Barbara Jean Horn case file hasn't even been pulled. For Fai, that's disappointing. I think it's crazy that they wouldn't want to try to solve this or help out, she said, adding that she and her family are raising money to hire a private investigator. Fai has an ally in Agrod. He too wants the real killer to be caught. I want to know who did this. I mean, we have to close this, he said. The initial investigation into Barbara Jean Horn's 1988 murder went cold. It wasn't until 1992 that two Philly police detectives arrested Ogrod for the crime, saying he confessed. But Ogrod maintained during his two trials that he didn't kill Barbara Jean and that he had been coerced into signing a false confession. The jury in the first trial had decided to acquit Ogrod, but one juror shouted that he disagreed and the judge ruled it a mistrial. In 1996, prosecutors had two jailhouse snitches testify that Ogrod confessed to them that he killed Barbara Jean. A jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to death. Then in 2018, while investigating the wrongful conviction of Anthony Wright, the DA's Conviction Integrity Unit found that the detectives in that case had handled other cases that had previously been raised as questionable. One of those cases was Walter Agras. Cummings recalled that it became clear to her and Carrie Wood, the lead attorney in review, that the Agrod investigation was botched. You got the wrong person. You put them on trial and you convicted them, and then you incarcerated them for a quarter of a century, she said. Her office sought to overturn Agra's conviction. Agra was released from state prison last June. When I got out, it just, it just came down at once, he said of the emotional relief.
But since returning to Northeast Philly, Agrod says he has struggled to get back on his feet, figuratively and literally. He had to get hip replacement surgery in February and still wobbles in pain when he walks. He says sleeping in a thin foam mattress all those years in prison took a hit on his body. You're touching the metal, it's very painful, he said. He is collecting unemployment and applied for disability payments. He has no other income or savings. It's like the state says, oh, you proved us wrong. The hell with you. You ain't get nothing for that, he said. Pennsylvania is one of 14 states that doesn't compensate the wrongfully convicted. Agrod would have to sue the government for any monetary relief. He's hoping he can get back to work, perhaps in trucking which is what he did before his arrest. In the meantime, he hopes police will track down Barbara Jean's real killer. The person is out there, has to be caught, he said. Because what else are they doing to children out there? Number 4. Helene Prasinski was kidnapped, raped and murdered on January 16, 1980, and her case went cold for nearly 40 years until DNA developments allowed law enforcement to identify and arrest James Clanton. On July 1, 2020, Clanton was sentenced to life in prison for her murder. NBC's Dateline explores the murder of 21-year-old Prasinski and the multi-decade search by authorities and Prasinski's family to find her killer. At the sentencing hearing, Prasinski's sister Janet Johnson described her sister as friendly, intelligent and kind. It never got any easier, Johnson said. It was as if someone had reached in and torn our hearts out, she explained how the decades of not knowing who was responsible for her sister's death had affected the family. Prasinski had just moved to Colorado from Massachusetts a few weeks before she died. The young woman was interested in journalism and was staying with relatives, taking the bus to and from work every day. The bus stop was only a few blocks away from her home, but on January 16, 1980, she never made it home from work, the Denver Post reported. Prasinski's friend and housemate, Kitsy Snow, spoke at Clanton's sentencing hearing 40 years later and read her journal entries from that night, transcribed by the Denver Post. At 11 p.m., she'd written about how worried she and the family were, this has been the longest and worst day of my life. I am writing, because I don't know what else to do, we waited for Helene to come home, and waited. Two hours later, she added, still nothing, will this night ever end? At 3 a.m., she wrote, we are trying to decide when to call her mom and dad, we know something is very wrong. I think we should call them. If it was my daughter, I'd want to know. The day after she went missing, Krasinski's body was found in a field. The promising 21-year-old intern had been stabbed nine times in the back, the Post wrote. Krasinski's family wouldn't have any answers until decades later. In 2017, detectives used DNA collected from the crime scene to search genealogy websites for a suspect or relatives of a suspect. They eventually narrowed results down to James Curtis Clanton, previously known as Curtis Allen White, a truck driver who was living in Florida, where he'd changed his name two years after Prasinski's murder, Nine News reported. Investigators collected his DNA from a beer glass and found that it matched the crime scene DNA. Clanton was arrested in December 2019 and pleaded guilty to first-degree murder in February 2020, according to CBS Boston. Before Prasinski's murder, Clanton had served about four years in an Arkansas prison for rape and was out on parole. He had been given permission to live with a former counselor in the Denver suburb, where Prasinski was eventually killed, the outlet reported. On July 1, 2020, the 63-year-old Clanton was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. Although he was accused of raping Prasinski, Clanton was not charged with sexual assault due to an expired statute of limitations, Wicked Local reported.